Welcome to today's webinar. The coordinators for today's session will be Nanette Warburton and myself, Sana Jardine. SAFMED has launched their digital courses now, and we have the following three things to offer. We'll be running our CSSD Foundation course digitally. We've got an Express e-learning, which is self-study, and the webinar series, which of course you're attending today. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about managing instruments and devices contaminated by pathogenic microorganisms, specifically focusing on managing them in the operating room and how we will carefully transport these contaminated devices to the dirty side of the CSSD. In today's session, we're going to kick off by talking about the decontamination process itself. Then we'll talk about aerosol generating procedures and the risk in the operating room. We'll discuss mitigating risk in the operating room. We'll look at the point of use, care of the instruments, and then safe and correct transportation of those contaminated instruments and devices. As you know, all instruments need to go through a process, a series of steps in order to make them safe to be used on a patient. And that process begins at the cleaning point. We take our instruments, we use them in the operating room, we transport them to the dirty side of the CCSD, and we begin the cleaning process. That cleaning could be manual or automated. Once we finish cleaning them, we inspect them to make sure that they are indeed clean. We then pack them. We then put them into a sterile barrier system of some sort, which could be wrap or a sterilization bag. After that, they're placed in a sterilizer. It could be a steam sterilizer or a low temperature sterilizer. Once they come out the sterilizer, we have to transport them safely, again, so that we don't contaminate them. And then we take them to a storage area. After storage, they are collected and they go to the operating room and they are used. After use, we need to transport them safely again to the dirty side of the CSSD. Today, we will focus on the operating room and safe transport. Kindly, MediClinic has shared with me today their procedures and processes for managing um, a variety of things in the operating room, um, especially around COVID, of course, being our, our latest um, pathogen that we need to worry about. And part of this, of course, will be talking around aerosol generating procedures. Um, also, other pathogens that we worry about in the operating room are hepatitis and HIV. And often those two, we, can, we manage um, splashing, we manage sharps, we manage um, um, exposure to bloodborne pathogens because we can see them. They're a little bit easier to manage. Uh, COVID being this virus can be aerosolized um, under certain circumstances. It is more droplet. We know that that's how it's transmitted, but we know it can be aerosolized. And that changes our environment a little bit because that's not an aspect we always deal with. That's not an aspect we always see in the operating rooms, and it's not always an aspect we deal with in our CCSDs. So we need to change our mentality and learn a little bit more about managing aerosol generating procedures in our ORs and of course in our CCSDs. Then of course today we want to talk about instruments uh, and the environment in the operating room, how we're managing our stuff around there. We know that our instruments and devices can transmit disease, all sorts of horrible things like CRE, hepatitis, Klebsiella. Uh, there's loads of published papers around the fact that these contaminated devices, if not properly cleaned, will and can transmit disease. Let's begin with this really interesting uh, published paper from the Annals of Surgery. This paper uh, discussed the importance of protecting surgical teams during COVID-19 outbreak. Um, as you can see, it was a narrative review published um, this year. A lot of, of papers around COVID-19 are, are being published quite early. Some of them have been peer-reviewed. Some of them haven't been peer-reviewed, uh, which is a point we do have to take into account. This paper goes on to refer to the fact that surgical teams are uni uniquely, and we are uniquely at high risk for, for COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, as it's correctly called. Viral particles have been found in nasal swabs and pharyngeal swabs in sputum and bronchial swabs and, and uh, gastrointestinal tissue in blood in stool. 
Surfaces have been found in isolation rooms, on shoes, in all sorts of strange places. We know that the virus can be spread via aerosols and fomites and can survive for periods of time as an aerosol and as we know on surfaces for periods of time, almost days in fact. What does that mean for us and what is this paper trying to teach us about protecting the surgical team? How do we protect ourselves? And one of the important aspects that we need to bear in mind is that we have to assume that the entire operating room will be contaminated. If you are operating on a patient that is COVID positive, uh, then you need to assume that the entire operating room will be contaminated at the end of the case. In America, the recommendation is, um, and in fact it alludes to that in this particular published paper, that we should manage the operating room with negative pressure. And um, that's not necessarily a, an aspect that is agreed to all over the world. The European um, market doesn't appear to abide by that. Professor Mita in her lecture the other day was also not convinced that negative pressure in the operating room was a necessity. And uh, a point just to bear in mind is how do we manage the air conditioning and the HVAC in the operating rooms? An important factor, choose the PPE that is effective against aerosolized particles in the operating room when dealing with COVID-19 patients. It actually doesn't matter what we're doing, whether it's we're in the operating room or we're nursing the patient at the bedside or we're nursing the patient at the ICU. Whether it's COVID-19, whether it's hepatitis, it actually doesn't matter what microorganism we're dealing with or what pathogen, we really have to wear a PPE, the type of PPE, the level of PPE and the items that are relevant to the procedure that we're doing and of course to the, to the microorganism that we are dealing with. Of great importance is viral and bacterial aerosols have been identified in surgical plumes, both in laparoscopic surgery and open procedures. And another aspect that they refer to in this, um, in, in this article, which I think is really quite an important one, is the importance of using a buddy system, of course, for donning and for doffing, for removing our PPE. I imagine that that's probably one of the most high-risk events um, for all of us in the event of, of COVID or any other, other pathogen that we're facing is that how we take off our PPE becomes very, very important. We need to follow the correct steps and it really helps if there's a second person there helping and assisting with the process and reminding you what to do next along the way. We will cover donning and doffing in our next webinar. In this particular pa uh, paper published by, um, let's see, uh, Dr. Tr Hirschman and team, this is an orthopedic-based publication. It's around uh, from the Knee Surgery Sports and Traumatology uh, Journal. And here they talk a little bit about um, what's specific to orthopedic and trauma surgery. Initially, the recommendations around managing aerosol generating procedures in surgery uh, were, were not that clear in the UK. I, I don't know that we have that many outlined in South Africa per se, but um, the, this information um, is taking time to disseminate as we understand what's going on. Eventually in 2020, the UK um, uh, managed to publish some guidelines and an important factor that they speak about were the following. Power tools. Pulse lavage, electrocautery are all surgically aerosol generating procedures. And they are procedures that will put us in the operating rooms at risk, especially if we are a patient that's positive for COVID-19. So in these guidelines, they specify that we should firstly wear level four surgical gowns. And gowns and the different types of gowns is a very critical factor. Uh, a level four gown is completely different, of course, to a level two gown. It depends on whose norms and standards you follow in terms of how you define a gown. But a surgical gown, a level four gown, will be one that is resistant to fluids um, and aerosols. Of course, we will need to wear a face shield or a set of goggles to protect our eyes. In this particular paper, they recommend the use of double gloving. It is orthopedic surgery and often double gloving is used anyway in orthopedic surgery. And then there's reference made to FFP2 or N95 or N95 masks. So respirators that um, are really and truly geared towards managing aerosolized generating or, or uh, viruses that have been aerosolized should I?
again, another interesting paper. Um, um, I would like to actually hand out a, a prize to the individual who has the ability to pronounce the name of this journal. I'm going to have a go at it. I'd like you all to, you know, while you're sitting there quietly, see if you could figure out how to say this. The International Journal of Pediatric Otto Rhino Laringo, and I can't get the rest. I think Otto Rhino Laryngology, maybe? Perhaps that's how to pronounce it. Um, but, of course, focusing on procedures uh, that are in an area in the mouth and in the throat that, um, that can be scary, that we know will produce uh, uh, aerosols again. The object of this particular paper, as you can see, was to find a structured way for the, the perioperative team to manage anything that's an aerosol generating procedure, uh, managing secretions around the airway so, so as to minimize staff exposure. I have to say that uh, impressively a lot of the aspects that were raised in this particular paper are already covered in, in MediClinic's um, SOP around uh, COVID-19 in the operating room. In this particular published paper, the first thing that I, I could surmise out of it were the basic general principles, and these principles are incredibly logical. It makes sense that before you do a surgical procedure, you will, you will plan what needs to be done. Certainly, there requires to be a lot of communication between the doctors, the staff, and the staff themselves, that you're going to use the highest level of PPE or the PPE that is required for that particular procedure. As we know, we're referring to procedures that we know that are going to create aerosols, and if we need to deal with patients that have COVID, these are the aspects that we need to take into place. Fewest number of staff, restricting the access to the operating room, limiting direct patient contact, and there are a variety of ways to do that, of course. Try a technique or use a technique that produces the least amount of aerosols and reduce the amount of handling of contaminated instruments and surfaces where respiratory secretions may have settled. I'm not 100% sure how to do that, but I think that is quite an interesting aspect because what does worry me is, is how many aerosols end up on the surfaces around the anesthetic machine. It's an area I think we need to be worried about. This published paper then goes on to, um, to outline an eight-step checklist. It's quite an extensive checklist, and a lot of the, the aspects covered in here are the things that we would normally do for preparing for a patient, regardless of what type of um, pathogenic microorganism you're facing. But it's a really nice checklist. Remember, the concept behind checklists is to help us uh, recall and do all of the steps that are required from a safety perspective. Uh, the same like it was employed in the airline so that the aeroplane doesn't crash. There are a number of steps that we can do um, uh, to follow processes and procedures like the timeout concept. They're all there to remind us to protect us. Some of the, some of the uh, points that I took out of that checklist that I thought were really good, again, they're, they're things that we do every day, things that we are truly aware of, but they're just there to remind us of the importance of it. For example, we're, in a, we're now wearing N95 masks, perhaps, or a surgical mask, depending on the circumstances, with a face shield and a visor. Please remember to speak loudly. In the PPE, we will have difficulty hearing. We are used to dealing with surgeons that have PPE on, but somebody who's on the floor may not be able to hear clearly with all of the PPE. Um, covered in this, in this published paper is the aspect of using uh, plastic drapes um, uh, when covering the patient's airway during intubation and extubation, as well as the concept of the Perspex box, trying to form a, a hard barrier so that the patient, uh, when the patient uh, generates any aerosols that come out the patient's mouth, that we are not exposed to those droplets. A concept, of course, of great importance is deep extubation, again, to try to avoid the patient coughing. Recover in the operating room, not in the recovery room. Again, that makes very good sense. Another aspect alluded to here, as well as in the previous paper, was the, the concept of using a spotter, especially when doffing or removing your PPE. 
And they also talk about that concept of leaving the operating room open for 30 minutes. So open being no new patients, close the door and allow the HVAC to do its job. In this paper, they don't talk about negative pressure. From what I understand, a number of hospitals have really put this into, into place. Um, I saw this Twitter post um, the other day from the New England Journal of Medicine, and I see that, that this particular article sparked quite a debate. There were some anaesthetists or doctors who had said that this, they thought this was really good. The box is there to reduce the amount of, of material expelled uh, from a patient's cough uh, when we are busy intubating and extubating, and it seems to be a very effective method. Some others thought that it, was, it hindered their ability to care for the patient. Okay, so we've spoken about aerosol generating procedures in the operating room and because of that I need to change our way of thinking and I need to, I need to up our game. We know about the other pathogens that we focused with or that we, um, we have to deal with on a regular basis, the blood-borne ones like hepatitis and HIV, and they teach us about um, managing sharps, managing any splashes, managing any spills on ourselves. And that's an aspect, in fact, for perhaps a new webinar about managing sharps and sharp safety. That could be a whole different entity. If that's a topic that appeals to you, please let us know because we can look into that for you. Again, lots of published paper around that. Let's move on to, to thinking a little bit more about our instruments and the environment, the operating room itself. We know that there are numerous published papers about transmission of disease from CREs, from hepatitis, from Klebsiella pneumonia and numerous other microorganisms. I'm not too sure if you've ever thought of this. As a student nurse, I recall pushing out theatres, many, many, many theatres, um, and uh, we, we got in there. We, we, we got quite wet, we cleaned, we disinfected, we decontaminated, we managed our operating rooms. And of course, part of that is cleaning the equipment. And please don't forget your operating lights. This is a very nice paper from the American Journal, American Journal of Infection Control that looked at and swabbed some operating lights um, in five different operating theaters. It's a small sample group, but it is still interesting information. Three out of five of the operating lights in these theaters tested positive for bacterial growth. Um, um, strep and, and staph are things we know we need to worry about. We know that these are multi-drug resistant organisms and we can find them on our operating lights. This is a paper that looked at mobile phones, um, cell phones, which of course I'm, I'm hoping that you are managing these devices in your operating rooms. We know we can manage our staff, but there are anaesthetists and doctors who also have these devices. We've got tablets, we've got um, uh, all sorts of electronic devices in our operating room. In this case, this research was performed in a, in a theatre setting. They used 32 staff. Of those staff, 12 were neurosurgeon, 8 were anaesthetists, 8 were nurses. They had staff clean their hands at the end of the list um, using hand rub. And they tested their hands, and of course they did bacterial cultures, and nothing was found on their hands. All staff were then asked to reach into their pockets and make a short, a short call on their mobile, put your phone back in, in the pocket, and then they cultured staff's hands again, and these were the results, Klebsiella pneumonia, Shoratia, and of course Staph aureus. Our phones, our hands, we are contaminated. We need to be very, very careful about these devices. What are we doing to, managing them, to manage them? How are we disinfecting them? It's quite difficult with electronic devices. Um, we found one of the methods that we've been using and we're employing it even in our own office is to make use of UV. So we have a small box that we, we uh, put our devices into so that we can make sure that our electronics are, are, are well managed. This is a paper out of Ghana, and I thought it's so relevant. It's African, it's close to home, and it's about traffic flow and microbial air contamination in operating rooms. 
In this particular incident, they looked at 124 surgical procedures. They were clean or clean contaminated elective surgical procedures, and they measured a few things, like how many times the door was opened. I find this absolutely fascinating. An average of 40, uh, oh, apologies, 54 times per case that the door, the theater doors were opened and closed. 54 times per case. With this, they also me measured the number of um, colony forming units in the in the actual theatres, and as you can see, it's quite obvious the more open more times you open and close the door, the higher the levels are going to be. Eighty four percent of samples exceeded the recommended levels. Of those 54 times that the doors were opened and closed, 77% of them were deemed completely unnecessary as they were only for social visits. 6% were deemed to be semi-necessary because we do need occasionally to take a lunch break or go to the bathroom, and 17% were actually necessary for obtaining additional equipment and instrumentation. Another area of great concern for me are laryngoscope blades. Laryngoscope blades are, in my opinion, poorly managed in most of our operating theatres. There is a tendency to, to take the uh, laryngoscope blade at the end of the case to nip off to the scrub basin, use the, the sponge the surgeon just used to, to wash his hands with, to clean the laryngoscope blade using the hand soap, whatever red detergent that's hanging around over there, rinse it off under the tap and pop it back onto the anesthetic trolley. We need to be concerned about not only our laryngoscope blades, but also the laryngoscope handles, because they themselves are often um, of, a, of a texture that's, that's quite difficult to clean. In this particular published paper, they looked at um, 83 ready-to-use laryngoscope blades. They were analyzed at two different hospitals, at hospital one, 76 percent of them, and at hospital two, 92 percent of them were positive for microorganisms. And they were horrible things. I mean, feces, for goodness sake, candida, E. coli. Our laryngoscope blades have to be decontaminated and managed according to the manufacturer's instructions for use. Some devices can be sterilized and should be sterilized, especially the blades. Some of them can't be, but at the very least, we need high-level disinfection on these devices. Remember, they're sitting on the anesthetic trolley. They're sitting on the, on the perhaps right there on the anesthetic delivery unit, and there is a good chance with droplets they are going to become infected. The ARN um, recommends the following things to take into account. The ARN recommends that surgical instruments be prepared for decontamination at the point of use. Because when blood or other bioburden dries on instruments, removal can be difficult and the effectiveness of disinfection and sterilization can be reduced. We've, we've said as, as a mantra almost in our courses, if it's not clean, it can never be sterilized. If it's not cleaned, it'll never be disinfected. And that's a very critical process. And because of that, the guidelines are clear that we need to start and manage our cleaning process as soon as possible. Scrub personnel will touch and contaminate every instrument within a tray and within a set. And it's quite obvious that you need to count them in the beginning of the case, you need to count them towards the end of the case. And as a result, you will have touched every single instrument in your tray, in your set. It is therefore absolutely critical that everything, everything that was in that operating room needs to be considered as contaminated. Whether the device was used or not, if the item was opened, it was on the sterile field, it is contaminated. We don't know what color cerebral, well, we know cerebral spinal fluid is clear. So we won't be able to see that, for example. Yes, we can see blood, but we can't see viral contaminants on our devices. So we really and truly have to assume that everything in that operating room that we use is contaminated, whether it appears to be contaminated or not.
This is my research for my master's where I looked at, um, it's a relatively small sample, at five hospitals in Gauteng. We, we looked at how instruments were being cleaned, so I inspected the cleaning methodology. After the cleaning, I tested the devices for residual proteins. If a device is positive for a protein, it is not cleaned. What did I find in that research? Well, in many instances at these five hospitals, as you can see, the worst was 21% of all the devices that I tested. There were over 350 odd instruments that I tested were still positive for proteins after being cleaned. Our cleaning is not always effective. We really and truly have to do everything we can to make sure that our devices are properly cleaned. The residual protein uh, methodology that I used over here at the time was a little bit more complex to use. You take a clean instrument and you wet a, wet a swab with three drops of sterile water. You take the swab uh, tip, you rub it over the selected area, you place it into the vial with an anhydrin. That vial then goes into an incubator and it incubated for an hour. And after that hour, you have a look at the swab to see whether or not there's a purple color change. Of course, nowadays, the products that are available on the market are a lot easier to use and you get almost an instant readout. So within a, a five second scenario, you'll know whether or not a device has or hasn't been cleaned properly. In my research, I didn't include the laryngoscope blades in here, but I think over 40% of the laryngoscope blades that I tested that were ready for use, I'll have you know, were positive for residual proteins. Also in my own research, it's a, again a small sample, but at that time what I was able to see that the instruments that were kept moist at all times were, not positive, were less positive for residual proteins. Those that were not kept moist had more residual proteins on them. So keeping instruments moist at the point of use is a very important, important factor. So this leads us to this uh, published guideline from the AORN uh, that was released again January um, uh, this year in 2020. Here are the five aspects or six aspects that they, they refer to. The very first important thing is that the cleaning and decontamination of devices needs to start as soon as possible after use. In the operating room, we please need to remove all gross soils by wiping the instruments down with sterile surgical sponge or a cloth or a whatever that is moistened with sterile water on the field while we are doing our surgical procedures. Remember not to use saline. Saline is corrosive. Our instruments become contaminated with, uh, with human bio burden and all sorts of other soils. Sometimes we may use an, um, uh, antibiotics or we've used some solution or we've used um, uh, all sorts of items that end up on our field. Uh, the mixing material when you're mixing uh, cement, uh, all sorts of things get contaminated, get, end up on our instruments. And we need to make 100% sure that we remove as much soil as we can by wiping them down during the procedure with sterile water. We know that it's important to keep our instruments moist. We even know that if we leave the dinner dishes uh, for a long period of time, they become more difficult to clean because once debris has dried on a device, it is very difficult to, keep, to clean it. Um, the guidelines suggest two different methods. We know we use these bowls of water, don't we? We keep all of our devices in a big bowl of water and it lies in there for absolute ages. That does worry me tremendously because um, the blood itself is corrosive, so we're leaving the device lying in a, in a solution of water with blood in it, so it's a little bit more corrosive. Water itself will also uh, lean towards corroding our instruments, especially the longer that the instrument is lying in there. Sometimes our instruments will go down to CSSD in that bowl of water and it may sit there for a lengthy period of time before we actually manage to wash it or we manage to load it into the washer disinfector. So the guidelines at the moment, as you can see here from the, from the document from the ARN, say you can keep them moist uh, by taking a towel, perhaps moisten the towel and pop them into a moist towel, or the newer methodology of using um, uh, transport gels and foams. When I first heard about the concept of transport gels and foams, I have to tell you, I thought, bloody companies trying to make money, you know. 
come on, we've been using this bowl of water for the last 20 years. But sadly, I had to, I had to learn that um, my thought process was a little skewed. Leaving instruments in, long, in bowls of water standing there for long periods of time is really not good for them. It is corrosive. So the, the concept of using transport gels and foams is really quite useful. They generally have a neutral pH. Um, they also are bacterial static, so they're not going to kill any microorganisms, but they are going to prevent the growth of microorganisms during that period of time, and they keep devices moist um, till such time as we can clean them. So a very useful type of thing to use in, the, in, in this day and age. Of course, in some countries, they use um, fancy bag systems where the, the bag is pre-impregnated with some, some um, enzymatic-based solution. Sometimes there's a sponge in it, and they pop everything into a bag and then send it uh, for transporting to the CCD in that way, making sure it remains uh, moist during transportation. The ARN document refers to opening and disassembling instruments made from multiple pieces. I'm not 100% sure if I'm comfortable with doing that in the operating room. I'm certainly comfortable doing that while I'm preparing the device for cleaning it. But in this document, they refer to opening and disassembling. And then, they, of course, they talk about managing um, sharp instruments and um, um, doing things safely by using puncture-resistant containers. This is an article. Um, I recall posting this on the on the CFSA's uh, page uh, from a hospital, the Porto Adventist uh, Hospital. Um, a news report in the Denver Post, and then an article that followed in the um, the healthcare purchasing news around making uh, the right time for instrument pre cleaning. This was in February uh, this year, and um, as you can see, the headlines say at least one death, hundreds of severe infections linked to, to Porter's hospital's use of contaminated surgical instrument. Um, and so far, this is all about the lawsuit that had ensued. I really hope none of our hospitals end up on the front line like that. We don't want to be the ones causing transmission of disease to our patients. In this particular incident, um, the summary in the document goes on to say that in the case of the Porto Adventist Hospital in Denver, failure of hospital staff to adequately pre-clean orthopedic and spine surgery tools contributed to the inadequate reprocessing and contaminated items being used in procedures, placing approximately 5,800 patients at risk for contracting HIV, hepatitis, or surgical site infections. So this was an in investigation that was undertaken by the Joint Commission. There were 129 instances where incomplete removal of gross surgical contamination occurred over this period of 13 months. And part of that they believe to be the, the process of the pre-cleaning. So the pre-cleaning and how we manage our instruments at point of use next to the patient's bed in the operating room is a very important concept and one that I think we need to remember to take into account. So if we take the operating room as a whole, let's think about how can we mitigate these risks that we've just alluded to. I summarize them in four different aspects. PPE and people. Wearing the PPE that is appropriate for the procedure that is about to be performed so that you have the right level of PPE. Using a spotter when it comes to donning and doffing that PPE. Of course, if it is an aerosol generating procedure, you need to be in an N95 mask. Are you wearing a face shield? Are you wearing, a gogg are you wearing goggles? Do you need to double glove? Restricting access and restricting the number of people in the operating rooms. If you're doing a COVID-19 positive patient, I do assume that you're removing as much equipment out of the operating room that is possible out the operating room before you begin the procedure, that you have a runner on the outside and that you're going to do everything in your power so that the door is not opened 54 times. 54 times during a normal procedure. Wow, that really isn't good practice. In the environment itself, we need to assume that everything is contaminated. 
is our air conditioning working correctly? Are we doing our swabbing uh, in, our, in our operating rooms? Are we checking that our HVAC is correct? Do we have evidence of that information? Do we know that our HVAC is working correctly? Are we cleaning and disinfecting the operating room properly according to our policies and procedures? Are we cleaning and disinfecting the equipment in the operating room correctly? Are we following the manufacturer's instructions for use? Do you actually know what the manufacturer's instructions for use are about how to clean your operating table, for example? Do you know what products you are supposed to be using or shouldn't be using? Have you taken into account that you could damage the piece of equipment if you don't use the right type of, um, of solutions? Then, of course, some hospitals are making use of UVC or of fogging in those operating rooms. Remember, all of those processes can only happen once you have cleaned. Cleaning is critical to the process. Uh, Yvonne Jameson has asked a question about, are we talking about main theatre doors or the side access doors? All of the doors, Yvonne. In this particular research, these were the side doors that they were opening. But of course, opening any door, a side door or a main door of an operating room is going to um, influence uh, the positive and negative pressures or the air conditioning anyway and could be rather detrimental to, the, to your case. Remember, if you're using fogging or you're using UVC in your operating room, as we said, we need to clean first. And remember, fogging in UVC is only line of sight. So these things can't get, by some miraculous method, get underneath the table. It's only line of sight, so we need to take that into consideration. And cleaning remains a critical factor. What can we do from a doctor perspective to mitigate the risk? Of course, it is pre-screening that we know the condition of the patient before the patient gets into, into the operating room. Uh, that there's clear and, and, and thorough, honest, frank communication with the staff and the team, that we know what surgical technique we are going to use and what approach we are going to use, that we know what intubation method is going to be used. I see in Mediclinic's uh, policy and procedure, the recommendation is that um, the anaesthetist, the anaesthetic nurse stay in the, in the operating room and the rest of the staff only come in once the patient is already intubated. That sounds like a very interesting concept. Instruments and devices, we've spoken about point of use, management of those devices, keeping them moist, and then, of course, following manufacturer's instructions for use. We might have some high-risk things like laryngoscope blades, of course, we've alluded to already, and bronchoscopes. How do we manage our bronchoscopes? Do our bronchoscopes need to be sterilized? Is high-level disinfection good enough on a bronchoscope? That remains a debate, is it not? And of course, we know in many, any, many countries in Europe, they've moved towards um, using low temperature sterilization to sterilize bronchoscopes. And that's a factor we need to take into concern. How well are we cleaning our drills? Again, the drills are being involved in, 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 in generation of aerosols. What are we doing about drills? Are we following the manufacturer's instructions for decontaminating our drills? So overall, the operating theater, of course, is a big concern because side doors often stand open and often routinely. So please, it doesn't matter what the procedure is, whether it's a COVID patient or not a COVID patient, please make sure you keep your theatre doors closed. The bowls of water, I think I've alluded to already. Not some, I've spoken already about soaking things in bowls of water around the aspect of rust and, um, and staining, etc., of our devices. But what also worries me is spillage. It's a debate now. What do you do with these bowls of water? I'm aware of one hospital that have uh, decided, if it's a COVID-based patient, that they will actually suction up the fluid um, into, into the suction in the operating room because they believe that to be the safest method of managing the bowls of water. I asked myself, do we need a bowl of water to begin with? I don't know. We need to consider that. When I scrubbed in the UK, we didn't have a bowl of water. We do still need something moist to manage our instruments with, but perhaps we can use less volume. Perhaps we can use a, a moistened swab. 
taps, we don't need such a huge bowl of water. If you're going to suck up this bowl of water into your suction liners in the operating room, those suction liners will go into the waste and that waste will have to be incinerated and that will be at great cost. What's safest for the patient? What's safest for the environment? What's safest for the circumstances? We do need to keep our devices moist, absolutely. But how do we do that? Are the bowls of water there historically? Because remember, we used to rinse our gloves and get all the glove plowed off. Or the bowls of water there for us? Yes, we need to keep the instruments moist. Yes, we need to clean them in between. But how do we manage them? Are there better ways of doing it? Moving on to safe and correct transport. Whoever is transporting the instruments and the devices, of course, need to wear the correct level of PPE for what it is they are doing. And, and um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person pushing the trolley needs to wear an N95 mask, but they do need to wear appropriate levels of PPE. Often we end up putting all of our stuff in. This is uh, of great concern to me because we'll throw the linen, the rubbish, a few bits of this, or another bit of that, all on top of each other on this huge piled trolley and lob that off to the CCT. Please remember that you need to do things at the point of use. Linen goes in the linen, rubbish goes in the rubbish. It doesn't matter if it's a known contaminated COVID patient or not, because we're assuming that all the instruments are contaminated with pathogenic material. That should be the assumption for all cases, all instances. So linen goes into linen, rubbish goes into rubbish, and the instruments remain hopefully on closed trolleys. Open trolleys like this are really and truly not ideal. When it came to talking about safe transportation, I thought, let me go and review all of the latest journals and guidelines that I could find. And my go-to places include the World Health Organization document that was printed with their guidelines, readily available on the internet. Anybody can get it. If you need the link, please let me know. The WFHSS, so I spoke about them in our first um, a webinar, that's the World Federation for Hospital Sterile Supplies. That is the community or the group um, that focuses on decontamination sciences. As I mentioned previously in, uh, in this particular uh, Congress that I attended of theirs last year, the WFHSS was an amazing uh, um, Congress that I managed to go to where people who are heads of CCSD have PhDs. Um, and these are people with PhDs in decontamination sciences managing our CCSDs. They have a series of guidelines that you can also go to at any, t at any point. And uh, Nanette's put the, um, the link to this in the chat box. And it's really an informative, interactive, nice document that you can go to at any time. You can't uh, print anything. Um, it uh, prohibits that, but you can uh, learn the most amazing amount of stuff. The other document I often refer to is an American standard. ST79. ST79 is um, nicely written. It's easy to read and very easy to understand. Um, the trick to it, though, is that you need to understand that South Africa, as a country, sits on, uh, we have the South African National Bureau of Standards, um, and I sit on TC1039, one of the committees. And um, we are uh, part and parcel then of the ISO standards. So we don't follow American standards, we follow ISO standards. Um, but the American uh, standard, this particular one, is nicely written and easy to understand. But you do have to understand the nuances behind America and European-based standards so that you have to remain in line with South Africa and European standards as well. Then the other um, document up, our journal that we subscribe to is this. It's called Central Sterilization. And um, this is a publication out of Germany. Uh, it's published in both English and Afrikaans, uh, Afrikaans, dear me, in both German and English. Um, and um, this journal has a number of um, recommendations that they publish um, uh, each day uh, in each issue. There are four issues a year. The publications are incredibly scientific, sometimes um, um, really interesting to read and sometimes incredibly hard to understand. I must admit, some of them are really technically oriented. Um, and in their guideline transport between the site of use and reprocessing departments, um, they also cover how it is we should safely transport and manage contaminated devices. 
So I reviewed all of these and summarized just six points because um, I needed to be succinct for today. Of course, we can go into a tremendous amount of detail around this, but these are the six points that I, um, that I took most cognizance of at this point. Very important to transport all of your devices, your contaminated devices, to the designated area where they are going to be cleaned as soon as possible after use. Items need to be transported in covered, fully enclosed, puncture-resistant containers, and we need to find a way to prevent spills of liquids. Containers that are used for transportation must be decontaminated after use. I'm aware of um, some hospitals, of course, use uh, sterilization containers. I've heard of people taking the dirty instruments, putting them back into the sterilization container itself and transporting it like that. I've heard of others putting the containers under the trolley and then the, the container itself doesn't really get cleaned. It kind of gets wiped down after use. I think we need to think about that a little bit more clearly. How does we manage our containers themselves if we're using sterilization containers? In this regard, I'm talking about taking all of your dirty instruments, putting them inside a fully enclosed puncture-resistant container. If it's your sterilization container that you use for that job, what about the, the filter on the top? Especially the reusable ones. Am I not going to dirty them? How am I going to clean those? We need to think about that. Okay. When you're transporting, of course, you need to be cautious on what route you take. In many of our hospitals, we have um, a small corridor, a small route. Um, in other, in other um, uh, bigger institutions, you might have the CCT on level two and, and um, theater on level nine. However, whatever the, the transport method is, please bear in mind that you need to follow a route that avoids high traffic and avoids any patient care areas. Carts and containers must be clearly identified, and you need to have a separate one for clean, of course. You need to have a separate one for dirty. Please make sure that you transport your items in a manner that are well identified so you know what's dirty. Sterile, it sounds logical, I know that. Sterile and soiled devices must not be transported together. So be cautious that it doesn't come to the end of the list and you think I haven't used this, in, this item, I'll just lob it on the same trolley and we'll pop it all down to the CSST. Please think about these concepts. So how do we define safe and correct transport? I've seen hospitals um, using really dodgy looking trolleys, but at least they're uh, closed uh, in some way and using their old wrap, uh, the, the used wrap to wrap the trays in. And then when it gets to the dirty side of the CSSD, they throw away the wrap and then they, um, then they uh, uh, continue with the cleaning process. I've seen hospitals using like these big gym type bins, sorry for the brand name, it's the only one I could think of. Um, and does that work? I don't know. Does it get scuffed? I don't, does it um, encourage the formation of biofilms wherever the plastic bin gets scuffed? Certainly lobbing your gown over it or just throwing a, a, a green towel or a blue towel over a trolley is not going to be sufficient. Then, of course, some hospitals will use fancier, um, more robust trolleys of different designs and descriptions, depending on the size, um, et cetera, that they need. Safe, correct transportation. Coming to the end or nearing the end of today's session, what have we spoken about? We've covered the decontamination process, what it takes to get an instrument that is safe to use on a patient. We've reminded ourselves of aerosol generating procedures in the operating room and the risk of transmission of disease in the operating room. We've looked at the important aspects of how to mitigate that risk. We've spoken about the point of use care of instruments, a very important part of the process, an important part that we need to rely on the theatre staff's assistance for that. And then lastly, we covered the safe and correct transportation of contaminated devices, doesn't matter what they're contaminated with, so that we can get them to the dirty side of the CCSD where we can transport them safely. <music>